Amen. Let's go to God's Word. Grab your Bible. Um, go to um, the New Testament. Um, over there by Hebrews, you'll find a book called Philemon. Uh, I want to share from that particular passage of Scripture for the next um, couple of weeks to see what God is saying so we can kind of hear from the Lord and be who God would have us to be. I was sharing with first service this morning, a um, little humor. My wife and I, while we were away, um, decided to do a devotion in the morning. And I said to her, open your Bible to the book of Philemon. And she opened her Bible and was going through it all over the place. And yeah, you're going all over the place. There you are. See, here you are. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, you got to Revelation like four times. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then she stopped and held the Bible up and she said, this is ridiculous. I need to stop using my phone for scripture. You know, because she kind of over time forgot the book of the Bible. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? So it, the, the written word, you can't go wrong with that. So make sure you get you a nice uh, written word to kind of reflect, reflect on the books of the Bible. Philemon, um, there's only one chapter. And I want to read um, these verses, then we're going to pray. And today I'm just going to lay some foundation on what we're going to be picking up in the upcoming weeks. If you're there, say amen. Amen, amen. good. Verse 8 says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is uh, required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Verse 12 says, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you may have him back forever. Verse 16 says, no longer as a bondservant, some of your translation says slave, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave or bondservant, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. Let us look to God for a word of prayer, and then we're going to share from this passage of Scripture that God would move and have his way. Holy Spirit, we thank you for you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this beautiful body, this congregation, this place called Restoration Christian Fellowship that you've placed here in this community to create places for people to belong, believe, and behave. As we open your word, God, speak afresh. I pray for a fresh anointing, God, a fresh flow of your spirit to speak with clarity so we can hear clearly what you're saying, and most importantly, so we can adjust to your word and change our behavior. So we thank you for what you're doing. You're wonderful, you're gracious, you're mighty, you're an awesome God. So we give our hearts to you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me say this parenthetically before I, I, I share my introduction with you, and that is um, I want to encourage you this Wednesday night, if at all possible, to come out and engage me, or let's engage this passage of Scripture. Uh, my intent today is to lay some foundation for what I'm going to be picking up and talking about uh, next week and prayerfully in the upcoming weeks if God says the same. But, but it's impossible to open up everything that the text talks about. And I think the text carries some very, very important um, principles and applications that's relevant for culture today. So on Wednesday, we can go some places that we can't go on a Sunday morning or don't have time to go. So come out on Wednesday at 6.30. We're going to engage the Scripture and be who God would have us be. So can I get you all to do that? Yeah. Amen. Thank God. Now here's where I want to begin. Um, as I read Philemon and, Philemon, and the more I go into this text, I am learning more and more that the issue of equality in the body of Christ, that's something that's really becoming a challenge or a problem more and more, and I'm going to use this phrase, in the household of God. And by that, and I'm not just talking about restoration, Christian fellowship. I am talking about the body of Christ at large. Here is what, here's what this looks like. We come to church, and we don't do this on Sunday morning, but on Wednesday we allot some time for testimony service. And some churches do that. And what we will do is we will sit there and we will listen to a person share their respective or individual testimony. 
and we hear the testimony, and a lot of us, we might not say this vocally or intentionally or out loud, but implicitly or subconsciously, we hear that testimony and we say, thank God that's not me. Or thank God that might not be my experience or my situation or my circumstance. And for the sake of conversation, if the testimony is a deliverance from something or some situation or something the person went through or some problem or challenge that may had, here is what we do without saying it out loud. We see people differently. Come on, I need, I need a couple of amens. I know this is second service and y'all, y'all slept in. First service, they got up early and they were saying amen. Y'all slept in. All right, it's so a couple of amen. So, but, but we see people differently, and, 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 and we say, you know, that's not my situation, that's not my circumstance, that not my um, um, predicament, and we see ourselves not as equals, but in some cases better than that person who went through said things. Come on, y'all, I need an amen or two. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Let, let me help you with what that looked like. Um, we're all familiar with, with Alcoholics Anonymous. Amen. So here's what happens. Alcoholics Anonymous has this 12-step process that they, they take people through. Then they have subsequent meetings where you just meet on a regular basis to kind of talk about the addiction or situation or circumstance that you're trying to get to deliver it from. So here's what this looked like. You go to an alcoholic anonymous meeting, and they're probably sitting in a circle, and everybody has a chair, and they go around the room, and then here's what the, meeting, the person says, um, hello, my name is Felix. Now, you're the alcoholic anonymous audience. What do you say to me? Yeah, see, y'all been there. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 y'all been there. Y'all been in a session. I get it now. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, don't tell me you saw it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> right. And this is what you said. Hi, Felix, right? And I respond, hi, my name is Felix. I am a recovering, and you fill in the blank with whatever it is I'm recovering from. If it's alcoholism, if it's pornography, if it's sexual addiction, if it's drug, whatever the situation is, my name is Felix, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and, and every meeting begins that way. Now, here's the problem. As I continue to attend those sessions, the longer I attend those sessions, I keep saying, my name is Felix, I am a recovering such and such. The issue I want to raise this morning and with this passage, at what point do I stop becoming or being a recovering person? And at what point does the finished work of Jesus on Calvary take effect on my life and I become delivered? Come on, y'all. I get delivered from the situation. Amen. The same is true. The same is true with society. This is how our culture works. A young man or a young woman might have committed a crime and they get sentenced or go to jail for their crime. Depending on the nature of the crime, they're charged with a felony. Now, here's the thing. The person does their complete time. They serve their sentence. They do everything that the punishment required for them to do. Because they were charged with a felony, they get released from prison. And here is what the rest of their life look like. My name is such and such. And because I made a mistake yesterday, I am an ex-felon. Come on, y'all. Come on. Come on. Talk to me. And, and that ex-status remains with them permanently such that it's difficult to get a job. It's difficult to reintegrate into society. It's difficult to be a normal part of the culture anymore because of what happened yesterday. Can anybody identify with what I'm saying? Come on. Y'all hear me, right? This is the problem that I'm finding that's going on. But I have learned that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old has gone. The new has come. So my challenge is at what point in time do we grow to the place where what happened to us in Christ starts to take effect so that I'm no longer judged, I'm no longer seen, I'm no longer treated, I no longer operated in my yesteryear, 
but I operate based on what God has called me to be, and I'm talking specifically to the church of God at large, and the, char- the church starts seeing me uh, for who I am today, not what I did yesterday. Come on, say amen. amen. Come on, talk to me. Now, this book, this book of Philemon, I believe it presents a great case study for us to press into those issues because this is the situation, this is the core of what's being dealt with in the book of Philemon. Someone made a mistake and the change had to happen and Paul is now challenging someone else to see the person not based on what they were yesterday, but what God has done in them. And I want us to flesh out the implications of what that means and what that looks like. So we want to look at this book of Philemon uh, Philemon, to kind of walk through it to see what God is saying. Now, this passage that's in front of us, it, it, it was written by the Apostle Paul during his imprisonment in Rome. Paul was imprisoned in house arrest for having preached the gospel of Jesus And the book was written about AD 60, where Paul found himself in the city of Rome being a, doing what God had called him to do, but he was in prison, so it was during his imprisonment that he ended up writing this letter. Now, the circumstances surround the writing of the letter I find to be very, very interesting, because the letter is Paul writing to this good friend of his, well, let me use a different word, this convert of his who was a slave owner by the name of Philemon. Now, what's striking about this, Philemon was a friend of Paul's. He owned a slave, and the slave somehow found himself in the presence of Paul in Rome, and Paul is writing this letter to get the slave to go back to his rightful owner. Now, there's three three theories or three views surrounding why it is that the slave found himself in the presence of Paul. The traditional view and the one that you've all heard and the one that you might um, adapt or adhere to, which you've heard in Sunday school, is that the slave whose name is Onesimus stole money or stole something from his master Philemon and was on the run and he was categorized as a runaway slave and he ended up finding himself in Rome in Paul's presence And what we've been taught traditionally is Paul encountered him. Paul spent time with him. Now Paul is writing a letter to Philemon to tell him to restore Onesimus back to his position. That's the traditional view. The second view you might have heard is that Onesimus and Paul, I mean Onesimus and Philemon had some challenges that they were going through at home. And trying to resolve the issue, Onesimus knew that Paul was a mentor to Philemon, so he escaped Philemon, went to Rome, and encountered Paul in hopes that Paul could write to Philemon to fix the issue between the two of them. There's a third view, and the third view is the one that I hold, and this view basically says that Philemon and Paul had a good relationship. They were ministry partners. And Paul found himself in prison, and Philemon and the church in his home that we're going to see in a little while took Onesimus and sent him to Rome to be of assistance and to be of aid to Paul. The challenge, however, is Onesimus liked the assignment so much that he overstayed his welcome And Paul now is having to write a letter to Philemon to encourage him to take and to explain the situation and to get him to take Onesimus back. That's my position. I believe Scripture kind of talks about that a little more. And so today, I want to flesh through that a little bit. So open up with me to the book of Philemon chapter 1. I mean, it's just one chapter, so it's not chapter 1. Philemon. And then we're going to read and we're going to talk through. And there's a few brief things that I want to share with you, and we'll see how far we make it through this this evening. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Verse 1 opens up with Paul greeting Philemon and the church there. Notice what he says. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, and then notice the recipient, to Philemon, and notice the word, our beloved brother. Come on, say beloved brother. Say it again, say beloved brother. 
I'll address that prayerfully later. If I don't get to that, we'll hit it tomorrow. And fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, um, and the church in your where? And the church where? In your house. Now, now, the reason I want to point that out is because apparently Philemon was the leader of a house church, which kind of draws me to the conclusion that Onesimus, who was a member of Philemon's household, was a servant in that church, and they sent him to serve Paul. So notice what he says in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch the prayer. Watch the prayer now as he kind of talks to, the, to Philemon in this letter. He begins by saying in verse 4, I thank God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now look at verse 7. For I have de derived much joy and comfort from whose love? Your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So what this is kind of hinting at, and, and we don't know, we don't know, specifically or explicitly what the details were surrounding Onesimus' departure from Philemon to being with Paul. So all we're doing is speculating or doing our best exegetical work to land to conclude on why we believe he left. The text is not explicitly clear. But what I see here in verse 7 is Paul saying to Philemon, thank you for helping me out. Thank you for considering me, so my prayers are with you. Thank you for what you did. And then verse 8 picks up where he says, now let us get to the issue at hand. So then Paul switches gears, and he goes right to the issue of hand, at hand, and he addresses Philemon. Now notice what he says in verse 8. Now let me read, and then we'll talk about this. Accordingly, he says, or therefore some of your translation says, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I'll explain. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Verse 11 says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Lord, that, that just touches me. He says in verse 12, I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but listen to what the ESV says, but by your own accord. Now, in summary form, here is what Paul is saying to, enough in, um, to Philemon. Hey, Philemon, I thank God for you. Thank God for the church. Thank God for everything you did. Thank you for the blessing. I praise God for that. Now let's get down to business. Now, here's what he says. I could tell you what to do. And I'm in such a position that I can make you do it. <laughs> My preference is not that I have to tell you what to do, nor do I have to make you do it. My preference is that when you hear the situation, your heart is such that you do it out of your love for God, not by compulsion. Oh, Lord Jesus. Come on, y'all. It's okay. It's okay. Let me, let me walk through this. So here, I, I want to share three things with you. Here's the first one. Attempts to restore broken relationship should not be done out of compulsion, but based on our love for God. I need at least three more amens. I'm going to wait for it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, let me tell you all what that means. Let me tell you what that means. If somebody has to come tell you to go to so-and-so and make it right, the problem is not with so-and-so anymore. The problem is with you. 
Oh, I want y'all to hear me say that. Especially if we name the name of God, right? If I claim to be a child of God, if I claim to be a Christian, if I claim to know God, and someone has to say, because I am your pastor, I am asking you to do it, something is wrong. Because now it comes down to compulsion speaking versus a love for God. So here's what Paul says. He says, I have every right to command you. But my preference is you get to the place where on your own accord you make the necessary adjustment to receive Onesimus. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. I'm a grandfather. I know you can't tell. I look like I'm 15. Um, <laughs> And I have three grandkids. I have three, three grandkids. Um, I have an old one, two boys, and I have a little girl. The oldest name is Jeremiah. The middle boy is Israel, and the girl is, um, what's her name? Jasmine. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> kind of went blank for a little while. Yeah, you know how this works, right? They're watching online, and you forgot my name. Um, so here's what this looks like. The oldest boy is the boss of all of them. Y'all got kids. Y'all know how this works, right? So that means he runs the house, he's the, he's the G, he's in charge, and I mean, he sits back in his own way, and he'll punch, kick, he'll beat up, he'll sneak, he'll do all that stuff to his younger sibling. Sometimes I watch it as the most hilarious thing. Hey, Israel, go get me something to drink. I'm like, who in the heck he think he is, you know? And, and if they don't do it, it's chaos. Now, the little girl, she's the snitch. Oh, yeah, she's the snitch, she's the snitch. She'll watch what's going on, and when a fight breaks out, she's the first one around. Grandpa, Grandpa, Jeremiah and Israel are fighting. They're fighting. And she act like, hey, nothing. And she's like, ooh, I'm going to see who's going to get beat, right? This is jazz. Now, here's how this comes about. I will get Jeremiah, and I'll get Israel together, and I'll have them stand in front of me. And my job as Grandpa is to help them make it right. Here's Israel. And he's crying watermelon tears because his bigger brother beat him up. Here's the bigger brother. Legs spread, arms folded, face pout. Y'all know how that look. Come on, y'all. And the matter he is, the higher the fold, right? You know, that's how we get. And he just turns like, hey, nothing wrong. And I said to him, say to your brother you're sorry. And here's what he does. Sorry. Still looking all crazy. Now, now, this is what I want you to hear me say. He's not doing it out of love. He's doing it out of compulsion. So here's what that means. His apology is not genuine. He just said it because an authority figure made him do it. Now, here's the problem. Because the authority figure made him do it, the, re the repentance or the apology is not genuine. So guess what happens? The moment I walk away, he unfolds one of those hands, just long enough, bam, puts it back up. <laughs> right? Because he was not truly repentant, and hear me say this, and the relationship is not fixed. So here's what that means. If, 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 if someone has to come to us in compulsion to command us to fix something or fix a broken relationship, it's not genuine. It ought to be out of what God has done in our hearts in showing us the wrong so we can make it right. Come on, somebody say amen this morning. It depends on God. And so here's what Paul is saying to Philemon. Um, Philemon, I have a situation that I need to bring up. Now, I could just carte blank say, hey, go do this, but I'm not going to do that because I want the, the Word of God, the love of God to permeate your heart so you do what's right. So notice what he says. Let's read. Let's notice what he says. And then we're going to move on to this. Notice what he says. Verse 8. I was bold and I could be bold enough to command you to do what's right, acquired, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner um, also for Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 10. Notice who he's talking about. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. Okay? Now, I said to you, Onesimus was a slave. And however he got to where he got, whether it's running away, whether it's an assignment that overstayed, whether he's going for help, whatever the situation, Onesimus found himself in Paul's presence. And here's a piece of information you need to know. Before Onesimus got to Paul, it is safe to conclude that he did not have a relationship with God. 
He didn't know Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And his encounter with Paul resulted in Paul leading him into a relationship with God such that Paul now refers to Onesimus as my child. Come on, do you see that? Do you see that? So, so here's what he says. I refer to you, I appeal to you on behalf of my child Onesimus, whose father or spiritual father I have become. Now, I like this. He says, I became his my father in my imprisonment. Verse 11 says, formerly, and, and lock into this, before I met him, he was useless to you, but indeed now... He is useful to you and to me. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Because this lock solidifies what I'm trying to, to imply or say to you. Before, while Onesimus, well, Onesimus was in uh, Philemon's house, he was useless to Philemon. He ends up, however he ends up in Paul's presence, God does a work through Paul in leading him to a relationship with Christ. A discipleship process ensues. And Onesimus, uh, Onesimus undergoes a change, and he becomes useful. Now, what's striking is the name Onesimus literally means useful. Literally means useful. So that means at one point in time, when he got his name, he was useful. But something happened that rendered him useless. But then he met Christ. And Christ did a work through Paul, and he became useful. I wish I had somebody in here again. And the reason I want to press that is because Onesimus used to be me, and Onesimus used to be you. Don't act like you hadn't done anything wrong. Come on, come on. There was a point in all of our lives when we were useless, but then we encountered Christ. And whatever he did on the finished work of Jesus on Calvary took our uselessness and forgave us for things we ought not be forgiven of. Oh, come on. Forgave us for wrongs that we might have done. Forgave us for misdeed that we have done. And he did a finished work in us, took the old man and created a new man. Now all of a sudden, guess what? We are useful. Do I have any useful folk in here that used to be useless? The reason I like that so much, the reason I like that so much is because the problem with us is we see ourselves only in our uselessness and forgot where we came from. Oh, don't act like that's not you. And we act as if we're sinless and we're blameless and we're faultless, like we haven't done anything wrong. And we hear a person where God is working on them in their useless state, and we look down through our spiritual eyes at them, not realizing that we too once were there. Anybody in here bold enough to say that was me? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And here's what I said to the church this morning, is that... In my useless state, you know, I was doing my study and I kind of reflected on some of the things I did when I was useless and some of the places I went and some of the behaviors I had. And, and I kind of had a smile on my face because when I reflected on that, it felt good. Oh, come on. You didn't go to the club because it wasn't fun. A bunch of holy people. You didn't do the misdeeds that you did because it wasn't fun. Now, I'm not saying it was right, but it felt good, and that's why we did it. And as long as the enemy can keep us fooled into the feeling at the time and not allow God to work on our lives, we stay there. I thank God that he got a hold of me. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going to say it this way. I thank God that I became somebody's child where I developed a relationship with him, and I was mentored, and I was discipled, and what once was useless. Ah, am I the only person in here that used to be useless? Come on. I am, am I the only person here that once was a sinner, but now I'm fine? Come on. But for the grace of God, but for the heart of God, but for the love of God, I find myself now useful. Amen. Anybody in here useful because God changed you? Come on, I need an amen. I need y'all just to celebrate God this morning. Thank God. Thank him for what he did. So Paul is saying, Paul is saying to Philemon, 
that Onesimus once was. He once was. He says, he, I'm his father. He was useless. Now he's useful. Now look at verse 12. This is important. So now I am sending him back to you. And we'll talk about the situation surrounding that tomorrow, next week. I am sending my very heart. And listen what he says in verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment of the gospel. Listen to what's being implied in that verse. Here's what Paul is saying in English. Hey, Philemon, um, you were supposed to come. He came in your place. Y'all not getting this. And I know your intent was just to send him for a little while, then he come back, then you come. But man, because of what God has done in him, my preference is, boy, you go ahead and stay, because this brother right here, y'all not get this. God has done some things in him, and my preference is that he stay, but it's not right. So I am sending him back. I am sending him back. Um... For you to get him, okay? And look at verse 14. But my pre I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. So Philemon, I'm sending him back. Now, I'm sending him back, and I don't want to force you. But when you see Onesimus, I want you to make a decision based on your own accord. Now look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. The letter continues. For... This, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever. That messed me up. Come on, y'all. That messed me up. That messed me up. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while that you may have him back forever. What, what, what Paul is saying here, Philemon... Could it have been, this is what the, 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 the verb, the Greek verb, um, he was parted from you, written in the passive voice says, could it have been Philemon that God allowed this to happen so he can be with me for a while, so when God gets through with him, he, you can have him. Oh, y'all, y'all don't, y'all, y'all, y'all not hearing me. You're not, come on, you're not hearing me, you're not hearing me, you're not hearing me. Because here's what we do. The moment things go wrong in our lives... Here's what we want to say. Y'all pray for me. The devil is on my back. Anything that looks negative in the life of a believer, we want to attribute to the devil. And I want to raise the issue. Could it be like Onesimus, God intervened to get your attention for a while? <sighs> my second point, my second point. Watch this real quick. Sometimes God will allow us to go through difficult situations. So he can transform us. Then he restores us. Come on, come on. Somebody say amen. Sometimes, sometimes. I'm almost done. God allows us to go through those difficult situations so he can transform us. And then at the end of the transformation, he restores us. Here's what this looked like. Um, Romans 8 and 28 says it this way. In all things, God works for the good of those who what? Love him. Those who are what? called according to his purpose. I call that divine providence or the providential intervention of God. Let me give you a biblical example, and then I'll give you two real life examples that works in my own life. It, anybody in here know the brother by the name of Joseph in the book of Genesis? Amen. I kind of see this principle working this way. God allowing Joseph's daddy to favor him. So that he give him a coat of many colors. Are you hearing me? God allowed his brothers to hate him. Y'all not hearing me. Because he received the coat of many colors. God also allowed the brothers that hate him to put him in a pit and sell him into slavery. Are you hearing me? So that God allowed that while he was in the pit that he'd be sold into slavery into Egypt to a, a trader by the name of Potiphar. So that Potiphar could buy him and take him on a journey to his house. God allowed Potiphar to take him to his house. So when he gets to Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife would tempt him to fall into sin. Such that he would run. 
but God allowed Potiphar to sentence Joseph to jail so that while in jail, he could meet a baker and a butler. And God allowed him to meet the baker and the butler in jail so when fair, so that one day that bacon butler would be released from jail. And God allowed Pharaoh to have a dream, y'all not hearing me, about what's happening so the baker and the butler could remember a fellow who was in jail so that Pharaoh can go just to deliver him so he can interpret my dream. Here's what this looks like. God allowed all that stuff to go through the life of Joseph so he can transform him, then restore him to the palace. Here's you and I. We want to skip the, rest, the, the transformation and get straight to restoration. And here's what happens. If your heart ain't right and you find yourself in positions without having been transformed, everything you do will be out of compulsion and not out of a heart or love for God. So God will take you through some stuff. So here's what Paul's saying to Philemon. Could it be Philemon that the divine passive says that God took Onesimus and put him through all that crazy stuff and worked out in him. And now that God is done, listen to how I'm going to say it. God now wants to put him back in the palace. You see, you see, you see, this is you and this is me. We're not ready to put folk in the palace because all we remember is the transformation they had to go through. That's all we think about. You used to be a drug addict. You don't deserve the palace. Come on, come on, come on. You used to be an alcoholic. You don't deserve the palace. Come on. You used to be a liar. You don't. Come on, don't. Come on, y'all. Don't act like I'm not telling the truth because here's what we do. Before we place people in position, we want to know what they used to do versus what God did. And so classism steps in the church. I'm better than you because I didn't do that. I'm better than you because I didn't go through that. My testimony is, I got saved at two. <laughs> Come on, y'all. So what you got saved at two? I got saved at 49. What makes you different? We both got saved. <laughs> I'm over time. Let me, I'm getting in trouble for this, but let me say this real quick. Two more illustrations. I have a brother that y'all met. John came here. And, and John spent seven years in prison. Um, we would call him ex-felon, such that every time John travels to the airport, he's the guy that the alarms goes off and all that stuff. They pull him in the room and go through what they got to go through because of his record. It's all cool. It's called, you ask John who he is, he's going to never say to you, I'm an ex-felon. He's going to say, I'm a preacher of the gospel of Christ. That's what he's going to say to you. I say that, and I said this the first service, he's probably the most effective pastor back on St. Croix because he underwent his transformation for his promotion. Here's what it looks like. John now, uh, John, John had a problem, you know, dealing with drug dealers, all that good stuff. That's his story. But he has a son. He has a son. And, and his oldest son now is following the path that he took in his younger years. Now, it's okay. It's okay. We have a group, me as a family, and we get together and we pray and we talk and we do things. So John put on our family's group, me, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, he says, hey, pray for my son. And he named him. And he says, pray for him that God would get a hold of him. Hear me, hear me. Not so much get a hold of him and deliver him, but God would submit him to a transformative process. And then John said, even if he got to go to jail... Let God send him to jail. We're not ready for that. We're not ready for that. Because here's what mama going to do. My baby. I need to collect an offering for bail money. <laughs> and we want to interrupt God's process. Versus allowing God to be God. Does this make sense? So, so Paul says, Paul says, I'm almost done with this. Here's what, here's, here's what Paul says to Philemon. He says here, he says, for perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. 
Now, now, here's my problem with the text, and here's what I want you not to miss, and I don't have time to, to flesh this out or reconcile it, so you have to come back next week, and you have to come Wednesday to ask me some questions. Verse 16, here's how you take him back, Philemon, no longer as a slave or bondservant, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, and how much more to you. Then he says this, watch this, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Okay? Now, now, now let, me, let me put this point up here and then uh, I'm going to talk about it and then we'll, be, we'll stop. Once God transforms us, we are not to be treated or behave, hear this out, as though we are still the old person. We are made new. And this is where it's going to mess with some of your theology, but walk this out with me, both physically and spiritually. Process that. When God transforms you, his expectation is not you continue to do the things you used to be in a transformed state. His expectation is that you stop, behave differently because he's fixed the thing that caused you to do what you did in the first place. He's instilled his spirit in you to help the spirit to control the flesh so it don't do it no more. Are you hearing me? A lot of implications because here's what Paul did not say. And, and I'll, I'll do a better job with this next Sunday. Paul did not say, hey, Philemon, I know he's your slave. So please note carefully, nowhere in the scripture does Paul say to Philemon, free him. Okay? And, and Paul is being cautious not to challenge Roman cultures and Roman laws as it relates to slaves and their masters. And we're going to talk about that. But what he does say carefully, he used to be a slave. When, he, when God got done with him, he's not a slave anymore. Oh my gosh. Physically and spiritually, in body and in flesh. Now, Here's what this means. Philemon, I know you own him. So when he comes back in your house, I know you're supposed to be his master and all that stuff. Those aren't issues for me. But when you see him, I want you to call him brother, not slave. That's some stuff. That's some stuff. You see, so don't look down your nose at him. And say, Onesimus, the runner race. No, no, no. Onesimus, my brother. Look, look at verse 1 real quick. Look at verse 1 real quick. Where it says, the letter's written to Philemon, our brother and fellow worker. And then Paul uses the same one. We're going to pick this up. Beloved brother now in verse 16. He was once a bond servant or a slave and a beloved brother, especially to me. How much more to you? And then he says this, both in the flesh. And in the Lord. We have to resolve these two worlds things, right? I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. I have to live in the world, but I'm not of the world. And I'm flesh in the world, but my flesh has been transformed. I have a spirit. How do I live? How do I work this out? Because this is the problem with the church. When you come in here and give your life to Christ, and God completes a transformative work in you, who you were yesterday is not who you are today. So here's all of Paul's theology let me teach you how to, to live life as a brother, not as an ex-felon. Let me teach you how to live life as a brother, not as a recovering alcoholic. Let me teach you how to live life as a brother. And I'm using neutral gender terms so women don't get offended, brother or sister, not as an adulterer. The problem with the church, we don't teach people how to live life based on what God has already done. Come on, Kitani. Come on, worship team. So here's my big idea. Regardless, regardless, regardless of our past as children of God and out of a love for God, we should treat each other equally 
my gosh, as equal members of God's family. I am an equal to you. You are an equal to me. We're all the same in the eyes of God. And so Paul is trying to say to Philemon, who he was is not who he is now. Work with that. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for you. Thank you for the God that you are. Thank you for what you're teaching us, God. Thank you for what you're doing. <sighs> Calvary is just something else. This Christian journey is challenging to understand. And now you took a slave. You sent him to Rome to meet Paul. And now Paul is telling his master he's not a slave anymore. What's that all about? So I don't know that this is an issue of restoration as it is encountering a new person because restoration would mean put him back in his slavery position. You're not asking for that. This is different. It's more than. So God, work on all of us, God to see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, completed in you, Onesimus. Once useful, useless, now useful. Once useless, now useful. Continue to work in our lives, God, as we give ourselves to you. In your name we pray. Bless you.